Father, thank you for um, this time that we have together. Thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And Jesus, I ask that you open up all of our hearts and minds. We will understand your word right now. We will um, have wisdom that comes only from your spirit. Settle all of our hearts and our spirits. Gosh, we've all been through a myriad of things this morning, getting ourselves here. And I pray right now that you help us to just put all of those aside. Carve out this space and this time in our hearts and our minds that we can study your word. We may understand it and we may grow closer to you, Jesus, from it. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, do I feel too short? down here. I'm sitting on a shorter stool. Can you all see me? Okay, good. Because I can go higher if I need to, but I would, that feels very awkward to be higher. So we'll start, we'll start here. But if at any time you ladies want to tell me, Cynthia, get on the stage, I'll get on the stage. Um, okay, so today, ladies, um, we are going to be diving into Genesis 1 and 2, which I am very excited about. There is so much in Genesis 1 and 2. The Entire Bible is pretty much based on Genesis 1 through 3. That's like the core of where scripture and the message of Jesus actually comes from. So, um, all right, so ladies, we are doing an overview of the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, Last week, we spent the entire class just introducing the Pentateuch and Genesis. Um, The Pentateuch is also called the Law or the writings of Moses. Last week, we asked the question, why do we study the Old Testament and the Pentateuch in particular? And we went through pretty much how Jesus answers that question for us. Remember, ladies, how in John 5, 46, he says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. And John 24, 27, um, or sorry, Luke 24, 27 And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then Luke 24, 44, Jesus said to them, this is what I told you. I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Jesus says that Moses wrote about him, that he has fulfilled everything written about him in the law of Moses or the Pentateuch. So that... So why do we read the Pentateuch? Because it's about who? It's about Jesus. Exactly. And so that is the goal of this class is to look for Jesus in the Pentateuch, to understand how the kingdom of God is established in Genesis and fulfilled in Jesus. So I'll say that again, how the kingdom of God is established in Genesis, but fulfilled in Jesus. So last week, we also asked, how do we know that what we read is actually what Moses wrote? So we went through that. Um, How do we know the documents have been transmitted accurately? That's essentially the question we asked. We asked, are the Bible and science at war with each other or do they align? So all those questions are in last week's podcast and you ladies can dive into that to hear those answers. So um, we also asked, where did the dates on your timeline come from? So if you want a review on how did I get those dates, where did they come from? You can also listen to last week's class. Okay, so we also went through last week the who, what, when, where, why, and how of Genesis. And I'm going to do that really briefly today. I'll probably begin most weeks that way, Um, but we're going to do like a very small, short version. So if you want the long version of the who, what, when, where, why, listen to last week's study or week one. So last week, we talked about um, how we believe Moses is the author, but he actually never identifies himself as the author. So I would love to ask you ladies, let's see if you can crawl back to last week, or actually, or you can look at your cheat sheet because I put it there too. Um, But there's sort of five reasons why we believe that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Now, the first, is Moses someone who could have written it based on his background? Could he have? And yes, and why? Because where was he educated? In Pharaoh's palace, exactly. So he was raised and educated in Pharaoh's palace, so he could have written, he would have had the abilities, the education, the training. He was qualified. That's what we say. He was qualified. Um, Second, how close was Moses to the story of everything that pretty much happens in Exodus and beyond? How close was he? He was what? He was in? He was firsthand. He was an eyewitness. He saw it all happen. 
He would have heard the stories of Genesis through oral tradition, and he would have experienced everything else that we read about in the Pentateuch. And so third, what did the Lord command Moses to do? He commanded Moses to write it down. There's many times I read to you ladies five scriptures last week where the Lord commands Moses to write down his words for the Israelite people. So fourth, does the Old Testament attribute Genesis and the Pentateuch to Moses? And the answer is yes, exactly. And do you remember specifically which person um, writes about Moses being the author of the law? Um, It's right away. It's um, the next book. Well, after the Pentateuch is Joshua. Joshua himself says that Moses wrote the law and that that's what they are reading. So the Old Testament itself attributes the Pentateuch to Moses. And then the final thing is the New Testament. The New Testament also does attribute the the, the law of Moses, the writings of Moses or the Pentateuch to Moses. Um, Both Jesus and the Apostle Paul assert that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch. So for all of that, for those scriptures, you can also listen to last week's study. Um, next, who was Genesis written to? And this is really important. Who was it originally written to? I missed number five. Okay. So it was, uh, Mo- why do we know that Moses was the author? He was qualified. He was an eyewitness. He was commanded. The Old Testament backs it up and the New Testament backs it up. So those are the five. Thanks. Um, so, okay. So who is Genesis written to, ladies? It's written to... The Israelites, exactly. Now, this is really, really important because it was written to nomadic, Semitic people 3,500 years ago. It was not written to us. And this is really important. We have to remember that Genesis was not written to us, but it was written for us. And there's a huge distinction there. It is written to a certain people at a certain time and a certain place with the intention of conveying the work of God to the following generation. So it was written for us, but it was not written to us. And that is really important to understand. Um, Okay, so approximately when was it written? Does anyone remember the date that Moses died? It's, you can shout it out if you do. It's on the sheet sheet. You can just, thank you, read it. Yeah, (laughs) 1406. So we believe Moses died in 1406. I gave you the reason for that date last week. Um, and if anyone just wants a brief on it, I'll go through it after class. And um, 1406, and so we believe that the Pentateuch was written before 1406, before he died. And then what type of writing is Genesis? And this is the funny thing. It's kind of a mix. There's a mixture of historical, allegorical, and theological. As I talked about last week, the biblical narr- narrators are intending to write history. We know that because they are obsessed with locating specific events in time and space. Um, They refer to commemorative markers like Rachel's tomb that are still here to this day. So they are obsessed with writing history. But the point is not history. The point is to teach theology. It's to teach who God is. The story of Genesis is not just the story of the Israelites. It's a story of God creating a kingdom people, of God creating order out of chaos and pushing back the darkness, of choosing to covenant with a certain people, of revealing himself and beginning to create his kingdom on earth. Moses writes real history with the point of teaching theology, but it also can be allegorical. We're going to talk a little bit this week, but more next week about how Adam is a historical figure, but also an allegorical figure. And the Bible is okay with him being both. So um, why, and then for the final thing, why was it written? It's to show the Israelites who they are in relationship to God, to create a theology of the knowledge of God and his purposes that was radically different than the pagan cultures around the Israelites. So as we begin to approach Genesis 1 through 2, we're going to ask the question, is Genesis 1 through 2 intended to be taken literally? So that's one of the questions we will be asking today. Many devout followers of Christ believe that it is to be taken literally. But what reasons might cause us to question whether it is intended to be taken literally? Well, first, it's the audience. It's the Israelites. We have to remember that the Israelites had just come from immersion in Egypt with their crazy polytheism. 
their pantheon of pagan gods, both male and female. Among them were Seth, the god of chaos, the god of violence and storms, Re, the sun god, Bastet, the goddess of the moon, and Amnon, the god of the air. All of these are huge, important gods and goddesses in the, in the world of the, of the Egyptians, which the Israelites had been immersed in for either, based on our timeline, 215 or 400 years. We're still figuring that one out. So um, the Israelites are poised to enter Canaan with people who worship Baal. Baal is a fertility deity, a god of creating life. He's called Lord of the earth and Lord of the rain and dew, the storm god who rides on the clouds. Last week, I told you the point of Genesis was not to teach how the world was created and when. But do you remember? What is the point of Jesus, of Genesis? It's supposed to teach what? Anyone remember? The who and the why, exactly. Who created and why he created, not the how and the when. So knowing all this, we're going to read Genesis 1 with our audience in mind and ask, what is Moses trying to teach the Israelites? So uh, if Genesis 1 was not meant to be a literal six-day creation, what clues lead us in that direction? So we're going to start with Genesis 1.1. Open up your Bibles, ladies. It's going to be fun. Okay. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right. Pausing there for just a sec. When did this occur? When does it say? In the beginning. In the beginning. Is there a specific time given? No, in the beginning, in the beginning of time. So now the word reshith in Hebrew for beginning meanings, means the first phase, the first step, the first element in a course of events, or the chief thing, like the choicest or finest, the first fruits of something. So in the beginning of the course of events, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-2. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So how is the earth described, ladies? What does it say? Formless, empty, exactly. So the word formless, tohu in Egypt means, sorry, in Hebrew means chaos. Lacking in form or shape, lacking in order or arrangement. So the earth was tohu, chaos, and it was empty, bohu, meaning empty or not filled, not occupied, but also, this is important, having no value or purpose. So the earth was tohu, chaos, bohu, no value or purpose. The earth was formless, chaotic, unfulfilled, and without purpose. But who was there, ladies? Who is right? And what specifically? The, the spirit of God. The spirit of God was there. I'm going to continue reading Genesis 1, verses 3 through 4. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So it in to enter into this chaos, into this darkness, into this disorder. What does God bring? Light. light. That's what he brings. He brings light. And how is this light described, ladies? It is good. This light is good. All right. We'll continue reading, picking it up in verse 6. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. 
The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bringing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So first, God separated light from dark. He pushes back the chaos and the disorder. Verse 6 through 8, what does God initially separate? He separates what? The waters above from what? The waters below. Exactly. So he separates the sea from the sky, the waters above from the waters below, creating order in the midst of this chaos. In verse 9 through 10, what does God then separate next? He separates the, the land from the sea. Exactly. So first it's water, and it, or water and sky. Then it's land and it's sea. And then verse 11, what does that then allow to do? What can grow? Plants. Plants, exactly. So it produces vegetation then. And all of this is called what, ladies? It's called good. It is called good. Notice we have three periods called day, periods of evening and periods of morning. But notice what celestial body has not yet appeared? The sun. Good job. We have three periods of evening and morning and no sun. But ladies, what is time based on? Time is based, our known time is based on what? The sun, right? It's based on the revolution of the earth around the sun. That is a day, a 24-hour day in our understanding. But we have no sun yet. So if there is no sun, then we don't have a human sense of a 24-hour day. We've also had vegetation appear. But don't we need the sun to grow vegetation? Isn't that part of the plan? So we ask, is the original intention to talk about the amount of time it took to create the world? Is, would that be the original intention to our original audience? Up to this point in Genesis 1, we've created three separate spaces, three points of order. We separated light from dark, air from water, land, and then land from ocean. In our next verses, we will see what fills these places and what inhabits them. So starting in Genesis 1, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said that the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about it according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So verses 14 through 19, what inhabits the places of the light and the dark? What inhabits them? It's the, you can just shout it out. What fills the sun, the stars? What else? The sun and the moon. Exactly. So think like an Israelite for just a moment. Who does it say created these things? God. Exactly. So one God, one single God over all these things. One God, not a pantheon of gods. One God in who creates and rules over the sun. 
The sun is not Re, a separate god. The moon is not Bastet, a separate goddess. They are not things to be worshipped. Who alone should be worshipped? God, the creator God, the one God over everything. Verses 20 through 23, what inhabits the places of the seas and the place of the air? It's inhabited by what? Creatures, living creatures. And God sees that everything he creates is what? Good. Everything he creates is good. And then verse 24 through 25, what first inhabits the place of dry land? It's what? It's animals, living creatures, and it was good. And then created last, signifying the crowning achievement, the greatest good. Who is created last? It's humankind, mankind, exactly. This is really interesting to me. Do you ladies, have any of you ever, ladies, ever heard what is the Hebrew word for mankind? It's Adam. Adam is the Hebrew word for mankind. So literally in verse 25 through 26, it says, then God said, let us make Adam in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air over the livestock. So let us make Adam, humankind, they, Adam. So does that surprise any of you ladies that Adam, Adam is the generic name for all humankind? We'll come back to that. Okay, so God has created these spaces. He has filled these spaces and all of his creative work is is good, exactly. So what things, ladies, and I would love to have you throw out some answers to me now. What things do we learn about God from these opening verses. What do we learn about God? He's what? Creative. He's creative. Good. What else? He likes things that are good. <laughs> he, he likes order. Absolutely. What else do we learn about him? He is all powerful. Everything is under the footstool of God. He is the creator God who reigns above everything. Every celestial being is under him. Every little G God is under him, right? He is the ruler of all things. He is the great I am, the Alpha and Omega, who always was, always is, and always will be. All that he creates is good. All that he creates is orderly. Were you going to add something? Totally, that we start with eternity, we drop into time, and then we end with eternity. Exactly. That's such a great perspective. Because time is only based on our worldly experience here. Outside of that, there is no sense of time, right? That's, that's powerful. So, and then in all things, what triumphs over all of these things? Does light or dark triumph? Does order or chaos? What triumphs? It's light triumphs. Order triumphs over all these things. And aren't all those things, things that we ladies need to know about God and rely on about him? We believe and rely on that God creates goodness that he has good plans for our lives and that he creates order and goodness out of the chaos of my life, right? We need to know that, that when there's chaos around us, that the Lord creates order and he creates goodness in this world. And ultimately, no matter how bad the darkness seems, God wins. And these are things that we need to know about the Lord. And notice in verse, uh, when God speaks in verse 26, this is interesting, What pronoun does he use, ladies? Us. Let us make mankind in our image. Keep your fingers here, ladies, in Genesis 1, but we're going to turn to John 1, 1. So turn in your Bibles over to John 1, 1, but keep your finger here. We're coming back. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, For him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning was the word. All right, we can turn back to Genesis. So when did this occur? Verse 1, John 1, when did it occur? In the beginning. Notice how the phrase is so purposeful. 
John is so purposely using the exact same phrase that Moses begins to start Genesis 1 and John 1, start the exact same way, in the beginning. And in the beginning, ladies, according to John 1, what existed? The word. The word, the word existed. And where was the word? The word was with God and the word was God. Verse 3, what was made through the word? All things. All things are made through the word. Verse 4, in him the word was what? Life and light. Life and light. And where does this light shine? In the darkness. Pause and just say, wow. When I was like studying this, I just had like literally this moment where I was like, wow. Like I just like sat there for a sec. In the beginning, God made his first step was separating light from darkness. And that light was Jesus. Jesus was there in the beginning. John is so clearly telling us that Jesus is who? Jesus is God. That is so clear. Jesus is the creator God separating order from chaos, separating light from darkness, and bringing light and hope and order and goodness and ultimate victory to our lives. All right, back to Genesis 1. So we, th- we also see the theology of the Trinity declared to us in the us. And John identifies that us as including Jesus. In verse 2, remember, who is hovering over the waters? It's the Spirit. The Spirit of God is hovering. So we see the us including the Spirit. So the cre- same creation Spirit who will descend on the disciples at Pentecost and inaugurate the new creation. The Spirit is there in the first creation. The Spirit will inaugurate the new creation. We see the us of God, including the word, Jesus. So what is Genesis 1 teaching us so far? It's teaching us a theology of one triumphant creator God, one monotheistic God who contains three forms, who rules over everything, a God who creates order and goodness and pushes back the darkness a benevolent, personal God who enters time and space to create us and we are good and he loves us. But there's more. We began to learn about who God is, but in the next verses, we are going to learn about who we are in relation to this God. So Genesis 1, 27 through 31. So God created mankind or Adam, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Notice that for a moment. So God created Adam in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Made in the image of God. Obvious question here, ladies. Are animals made in the image of God? No, they are not. Adam, male and female, are made in the image of God. Being made in the image of God gives us value, ladies. And notice that same value is placed on men and women. Why does every life have value? Because it's made in the image of who? Of God. That is why every life has value. The poor, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, everyone has value because they are made in the image of God. We see a difference in some cultures who do not come from this Judeo-Christian background, who don't implicitly believe that there is value in every life, who see some lives as expendable. We don't believe that because we believe every life has value simply by being made in the image of God. As, yeah, yes. Question. 
We're going to get there. Hold that. <laughs> That's a great point. And just hold on to that for a minute because we're going to get, we're coming back to that. Okay. As Christ followers, we stand in the belief that all human life has value because all Adam is made in the image of God. Being made in the image of God is what gives us value. Being made in God's image also means we are given a job. Did you see that, ladies? We are given a job. What job are, jobs are we given? Verse 20, verse 2. The first one is we are supposed to be what? Be fruitful. Literally, bear fruit. That's what it says. Bear fruit. When Jesus talks about bearing fruit, he's coming back to this. Be fruitful. Bear fruit. Increase in number. There's a sense of creating and spreading goodness, whether it's physically or whether it's the world, in how we inhabit the world around us. What's the second job that's given to us? We are to rule. God, as the ultimate authority, places his mantle of authority on humankind. Just like he creates order out of chaos, he places that job on us as well. Scholars call humankind God's viceroys or those who rule in his place. And, and that ruling is placed on both men and women as co-regents under God. God has created his kingdom and set humankind as those who rule under him and for him. When we as moms create order in our home, we are acting as God's viceroys. I have to say I do love this, personally, because I love to organize. So now when I walk around and say, this organized space is a godly space, my children are going to have to fall in line. So, um, but joking aside, when we create order in our communities, when we care for creation, human, animal, or plant, we are acting as God's image bearers. We are acting as his viceroys, those who rule in his place. We are not sent to destroy this beautiful world around us. We were created to push back the chaos and push back the destruction of the enemy. We are called to subdue evil as God's viceroys, to rule with order and moral goodness in the spheres that we occupy, in the places that he has placed us. So being made in the image of God means we are given two things. We are given worth and we are given work. And those are the two things he's given us, worth and work. Now, we've been through our six days. God created and we saw God create these ordered spaces. We saw him fill these ordered spaces. He set Adam, humankind, over this space to rule in his place. So what does God do next? <laughs> He takes a break. He does. All right. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God created, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. God's creation work is done. So what does he do? He, he rests. Exactly. Now, ladies, what is different about this seventh day? It is blessed, right? It is holy. But notice there is a phrase missing from the seventh day. Notice verse five. How does verse five end? Verse five ends with, if you look back on it, it ends with there was evening. And there was morning, the, fifth, the first day. Verse 8, there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Verse 13, there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. Verse 19, there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Verse 23, there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. I know my broken record. Verse 31, there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. What about the seventh day? Is there evening or morning? No. There is no evening and morning on the seventh day. Why is this significant? Many people believe we are still in the seventh day, that we live in the seventh day where God has come, he has created, and he rests. That He is present and he is there. This 
also leads us further away from viewing Genesis 1 through 2 as necessarily a six-day, a seven-day literal creation account. God has succeeded in creating order and establishing his kingdom. Victory and work are complete and final. And we now live with God in this sense of Sabbath rest, of dwelling with God in his presence. Remember, who is our author, ladies? Moses. Remember, who is it being written to? Israelites. Exactly. God has instituted the Sabbath as one of their Ten Commandments that they are to abide by and follow. Moses is here giving them the basis for this commandment. He's creating a theology of rest. Twice Moses refers back to the Sabbath rest. I'll read them both. First, Exodus 20. 8 through 11. Turn there if you want, or you can just listen. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now, the Israelites are these nomadic desert dwellers, right? We are entering into the midst of their 40 years in the desert. What is the one thing, do you ladies remember, the Israelites cannot do on the Sabbath? They cannot do what? They cannot cannot work. And what specifically are they not allowed to gather? Manna and quail, right? They are not allowed to gather these things. When the Lord instituted his provision for them of the daily manna and quail, it was they could only take how much? Do you remember? Enough, enough for each day. We could, they could only take enough for each day. And on their day before Sabbath, they could take how much? Enough for two days. Exactly. They could take enough for two days. Now, remember how at first some of them gather too much? on one day, trying to like hoard it for the next. And what happens? Do you remember? It decays. It just rots. Exactly. It's nasty the next day. And so then at first, some people go out looking for manna and quail on the Sabbath. But is there any? No, it's not there. So what is the core of this idea of rest then? What are the Israelites supposed to do? They're supposed to Worship worship and they're supposed to trust. Trust that he will take care of them. Trust that if they do not work on this seventh day, that the Lord will still provide all that they need, that he will lead them and guide them through their desert journey, that he will provide food for them every single day. Trust that God will provide. We rest on Sabbath because God has created the world and will provide everything that we need. Sabbath is rest and trust because he is trustworthy. Interestingly, in Deuteronomy, it was a little bit of a different spin put on Sabbath. So remember, same author, Exodus and Deuteronomy, both by Moses. I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. You're welcome to turn or just listen. Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. Okay, sorry, 12 through 15. Again, Moses speaking to the Israelites. Now, what's interesting, and we will get to this, is so Exodus is written as God is giving the commandments to Moses. He's writing them down. Deuteronomy is Moses' final speech when he's about to die, when he's sending the Israelites off into the land of Canaan with Josh in command, but without him. And so he writes Deuteronomy to remind them of everything they have gone through, to remind them to be faithful as they enter the land of Canaan. So it's a lot of repetition, but it's Moses reminding the Israelites who they are and who God is. But he gives a different reason for Sabbath. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.12, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter nor your male or female servant nor your ox, your donkey or any of your animals nor any foreigner, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. So, why here does Moses tell the Israelites to rest on the Sabbath? To remind them of what? 
God's rest for them because they had been what? They had been slaves. They had been slaves in Egypt and are no longer slaves. God has set his people free. He has liberated them from slavery. We are not slaves to work. We are not enslaved to the work around us. We are set free to rest in God and to trust in him. And we look forward to a final rest with God forever. So again, we see that Moses is teaching the Israelites about God through this creation account, about who God is and who they are in relation to him. There's this great quote from theologian Bruce K. Waltke. I really like him. He says, Sabbath reminds us that the critical moments are not the ones spent building, possessing, and controlling, but the time set apart for quiet reflection, meditation, and worship. I love that. And I have that on your class notes. So we started, ladies, with the macro, macro view of creation, of who God is and humankind is. In Genesis 2, we read more about the creation of Adam, humankind. Now, ladies, I'm going to tell you, previously, if you had asked me this question, why are there two versions of Genesis or of creation, I would have given you a different reason last spring. Previously, I understood Genesis 1 as the macro story, the big picture story, God creates humankind. And then Genesis 2 as the micro story and zeroing in on the first humans. So going from macro to micro. One author I read this summer, John Walton, who's a professor of Old Testament at Whedon College, so very conservative theological school. He is open to an understanding of theistic evolution, something I talked about with you ladies last week, that unlike Darwinism, this sees humans as simply chemical, responding to their environment without freedom or moral responsibility, that God could have worked through what's called theistic evolution, that God created the world and life and intimately continues to develop that life, that he worked through time and environment in an intimate sense of involved evolution, that God created in the past and still creates with every new life that is formed. So in this openness to theistic evolution, Walton actually asks, were Adam and Eve the first people? I have to tell you, this is a little mind-blowing for me. So what if Genesis 2 is not a micro look at Genesis 1, but the next phase, the next step? What if it's a continuation? What if God created humankind and then created special people to covenant with? This was a little mind-blowing to me, I'll be honest. But it also accounts for some things, like where did Cain and Seth get their wives? People have asked that question. Where did they come from? It also allows for a sense of theistic evolution. Now, ladies, I don't know. I have not done enough reading or personal thought processing to decide, am I on board with theistic evolution or not? I'm just going to lay it out there as something that is compatible with Scripture, that is not antithetical to worshiping and following our Lord. So... Uh, It also answers the question, how does Cain build a city if no one else exists? (laughs) But that's still to come. So what if, again, the point of Genesis 1 through 2 is not how and is not when? But what, because science can answer those questions for us. The Bible is not a scientific document. What if, again, the point is who created and why? That those are the questions that are being answered. Okay, I'm going to read Genesis um, 2, verses 4 through 7, with all this in mind. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed life, breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So God makes man, Adam, out of the ground or Adama. He makes Adam out of the Adama. There's a word play going on here in the Hebrew mind. Adam can mean humankind, as I said. It can also mean a single man. It becomes the name of this man in genealogical records in the Bible. Adam is considered a historical person. 
But with this wordplay, we also see him as allegorical and representing all of mankind as well. God forms Adam out of the Adama and breathes into him what? Breathes the breath of life. Now, again, I've personally not come to my perspective on theistic evolution or not. Um, those, I'm not against it though. Those who support theistic evolution say that this is the moment where God transformed ape into mankind. Because what do humans have that animals do not have? They have a soul, a spirit. So God breathes the breath of life into Adam and creates humankind. Some see God as breathing this immortal soul into Adam at this moment. Whether he is the first man or the first covenant man, God forms him. And he will place him in a special place. I'm going to read verses 8 through 17, chapter 2. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of the land is good. Aromatic resin and onks are also there. You can see, ladies, this is considered historical. He is placing this in a time, in a place, in a location. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Ladies, where do they believe that life began? Between what? The Tigris and the Euphrates. That's where archaeological evidence shows that humankind began in this exact spot. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Let's pause there. So where does God place Adam? He places him where? In a garden, which literally is a walled garden or a walled enclosure. So it's a special place walled off from the rest of creation. Many scholars have noticed a similarity, actually, between the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle. Both were places where God is uniquely present. Theologian G.K. Beale notices that the same Hebrew word form, hithpiel, used for God's walking back and forth in the garden, also describes God's presence in the tabernacle. I have scripture for you on your um, class notes. What is Adam's job? Verse 13. He's to do what? He's to work, take care of it and work it. He is to work it and take care of it. This is actually priestly language. It's the same language used of, the, of what the Levites were supposed to do in the tabernacle. And again, I have scripture for you on your class notes, so you can investigate that. Um, later, we see that, that, that there are cherubim guarding the entrance to the garden. I think you ladies might remember that there are statues of cherubim that guard the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. Israel's tabernacle and temple had wood carvings that gave it a garden-like ambiance. You can look up some of the scripture I have. Just as the entrance to Israel's temple faced east, so the entrance to Eden faces east. Just as gold and onyx are in the garden, so those are the exact same stones used to later decorate the sanctuaries in the priestly garments. So this picture is what it's doing is portraying Adam as a priest in God's holy sanctuary, enjoying a special relationship with God. And what's the point? It, it creates this image of a priestly Adam, the first person that God chooses to covenant with, to have a special relationship with. We will see God continue to covenant with Adam's offspring in the patriarchs. God chooses Adam, places him in a garden, and covenants with him. And what is God's first covenant? Adam enjoys God's special favor, special place, special presence. And what is his side of the covenant? Of the covenant? Verse 15. What is Adam supposed to do in verse 15? He's supposed to care. care. Exactly. Take care of this garden temple. 
What is he not supposed to do? He's not supposed to do what? Eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's the result of breaking this covenant? You will die. Okay, so all this is good, but it seems the task is too great for poor Adam. So Genesis 2, 18 through 25. All right. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground of the, all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. He had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So... We have kept reading the refrain, ladies, and it was good. What is the first thing that is not good? It's for man to be alone. We all felt that during the pandemic, didn't we? It is not good for mankind to be alone. But especially for this man, this task of governing was too great. So the parade of animals goes before Adam, and he names them, signifying authority over them. Naming was authority. But when What can't be found for Adam in verse 20? A suitable helper. So God places Adam in this supernatural deep state, possibly even a visionary state, and creates a woman out of the side of Adam. So the word for rib is also side. It's almost like he's cut in half and taken the side of him to form woman, signifying she is his equal in value, in dignity, because, and she is his partner, taken from his side. Moses then develops this theology of marriage and the intended relationship of men and women. Men and women are co-image bearers, equal in dignity and worth. The task of creating order and caring for the garden was too great for one person alone. Adam needs the perfect complement to him to help him where he falls short. The garden needs both the gifts of men and women to rule over it, to create order, to tend it. And we also see in this, the marriage is a monogamous, sacred relationship. And we will see men in the Bible not have monogamous relationships, and it always goes badly. But that was not God's intention. So ladies, today we've examined creation from the perspective of what is Moses teaching us about God? If the intention is not to teach a literal six-day creation, why would you... Okay, there's a question, ladies, and I would love your an answer. Why would Moses use the word day if he's not intending to, to create a theology of a literal six-day, seven-day creation? Why do you think he would use it? What was that? One way to express it. Absolutely. A way they would understand. That's perfect. Exactly. This is, okay, here's a big scholarly word. This is anthropomorphic language. So all that means is that God is using language that is understood. When we we see things like, we read things like God reaches out his hand. God doesn't have a hand. But we're using language that we can understand. That's called anthropomorphic language. Language that we understand as humans. So the biblical authors write about God in terms that people would have understood, especially people 3,500 years ago. The audience is not 21st century modern scientists. Um, who write. So the, um, the point, again, is teaching order, teaching the Israelites about who God is and who they are in relation to him. Though it may not be a literal six-day creation, though it is important to realize we are supposed to see this account as historical. God did create everything. Adam was a historical figure, but Moses writes history to teach theology. God is pushing back the darkness to establish his kingdom on earth, asserting his dominion over every other little G-God, as Miss Susie would say. 
known to the Israelites, beginning with one covenant man and then his community. So ladies, we will end there for today. At your tables, my two questions for you is just for you to talk about, kind of reviewing and what you took from today. What does Genesis 1 through 2 teach us about who God is? What does Genesis 1 through 2 teach us about who we are? Who God is and who we are. I'd love for you ladies to have a few minutes of table discussion. Um, I will close us in prayer right now, um, just to close us off neatly. And then I invite you ladies to stay until 1045 and chat about these questions together. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this time we have had together. Thank you for your word and just how good and sweet it is. Thank you that you are a God who has come down into our presence to establish order and goodness, to push back at the darkness around us. Help us to be women who also walk in that order and that goodness, also pushing back the darkness in the circles around us. Let us be your agents of light. Jesus, as we go from here, I pray that you will bless these women, that you will take care of these women and their families, that you will also provide them with opportunities today to be your light, to love, encourage, and bless someone around them. We love you so much. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.